house of God, we just want to give you all a real welcome if you're visiting with us. Really want to extend that welcome. I know we're slightly down in numbers. Um, COVID and sickness has really hit the welcome. But, you know, we're nearly two years into this. It was going to come at some time. And uh, we've been so well, you know, unscathed thus far. But there's just a number of our folks, even over the weekend, people that have phoned us that are, are not well, that are sick. And, you know, we'll pray for them very, very shortly. But it's great to see you that are here, all of the adults, all of the friends, and all the boys and girls as well. We're down in numbers with the kids, aren't we, as well? Must be a half term, maybe some of them are away, Mary. That's true. You see, we forget these things. You know what I mean? So gone are the days where you had a day to Newcastle or Port Roush in the summer. Back in the day, now we're really reminiscing, aren't we? Anyway, so we're going to stand and we're going to sing our opening song. <clears throat> that opening song will lead into our opening hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. I want to just welcome the folks as well that are watching online this morning. I would imagine the people that aren't here have got the comfort of picking up the laptop or turning on the, the TV and, and being able to follow YouTube and just be able to watch our, our morning broadcast. And so let's stand and sing Jesus Messiah followed by Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Let's stand together, please. about it, Gloria. Just come off it and I will talk for a moment. We're having a bit of, having a few issues with the computers at the minute. As you do, that's, that's the, the joys of technology. So, um, it is great to see you all and I did a m mention about we have our, our, we are opening hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. If we can't manage to sing that, we are going to lift the Lord's portion. We're going to lift our offering today. And maybe we could do that right now, Roy and David. Maybe we could just do that. And if we get it on, we can sing it. We'll just... All right? Okay? Let's just lift the offer. Yeah. Put it up there. Yeah. Yeah. That was a bit of an abrupt end, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder 
was any of the kids singing out of tune there? Is that what happened there? Any of you boys at the front? Cause the damage? All right, okay. Well, let's give on to the Lord. And as we give, you know, we can get ready for, um, we're going we're gonna to be praying very shortly as well, folks. Coming before the Lord in prayer. Remember that our giving is part of our worship. As well as singing, we can give unto the Lord, as well as reading God's Word and also preaching from God's Word. So let's just do that. And we will try and get this sorted. I know the Gloria and Lindsay are working away there at the back trying to get it sorted. There we go. Any of you boys want to be interested in learning how to be attack at the back? No? Do you? Yeah? <laughs> there we go. Right, <clears throat> okay, I just want to come before the Lord in prayer. Let's just settle our minds, settle our hearts, and let's come before the Lord. It's lovely to have Charlene and her family with us this morning because her mommy hasn't been too well. We've been praying for Linda, and we're just delighted that there's been an improvement. We've been just praying in the background. We've been following the Facebook posts, and we're just delighted that she's improving and so it's lovely to have the family here and we'll continue to pray that uh, that she'll make a speedy recovery. Some of you have been asking about my mum. She's been absent this last couple of weeks. Well, she was tested positive with COVID, took a real bad flu, has a real bad chest infection. She's on her second course of antibiotics and uh, I know that she appreciates your prayers and thoughts. So many of our folks, Andy, Andy and Kate, text yesterday, Kate has tested positive. We're thinking about you this morning, Kate and Andy, that God will bless you if you're watching online. Um, and other of our folks that are, that are absent um, through COVID, through sickness, thinking of Eddie Young today as well. I know Eddie hasn't been so well, and we're praying for him. So it is rampant at the minute through our church. I'm, I'm just looking down, and I'm counting at least 10 to 12 regulars who would normally be here but aren't. But you know what? God's still on the throne, we're still praying, and we're still trusting God. And so we're just going to pray right now. So would you bow with us, and let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we can draw near to a living God. A God who does understand everything that we go through while we're here upon this earth. Lord, first of all, as we have gathered, we're here to worship you. And we can worship, Lord, in our giving. We can worship in our singing. We can even worship right now with our heads bowed in reverence before you. And we thank you for the privilege of morning worship here in the welcome. And as we reverence your name, as we worship you and praise you, Lord, we just want to thank you for your goodness and all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Lord, I think of the bereaved today, and I think of the Wadsworth family across the street there in Oregon Gardens. And I pray, Lord God, that you'll comfort Sandra and her family as only you can at this time, and just be with them. Lord, I thank you for every remembrance of Stevie somebody that we've got to know over these years and has become a friend. And we ask, Lord, that you'll comfort them, Lord, as only you can. I do think of those that are sick who would normally be here. I'm thinking of Eddie Young this morning. I'm thinking of my mum. I'm thinking of others, right? Thinking of Andy and Kate, thinking of John. So many, Lord, that are missing today. And we pray for everyone who normally would be here that you would really give them a real blessing thinking of Rob today and Amanda, thinking of, of Gary today. We just think of them all, and we ask, Lord, that you'll bless them. Thinking of John Cameron, thinking of Margaret Cameron, Lord, bless them. Bless them all abundantly, we pray. And so as we think of the sick and the needy, and as we think of the bereaved, Lord, I thank you for everyone that is here, all the boys and girls, all of the adults, all of the folks that are watching online this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you'll encourage each heart. 
Lord, I do particularly pray also for Linda this morning. And I thank you, Lord, for what you've brought her through so far. And we just continue to pray that you will undertake for her. It's lovely to see her family here. Thank you for the power of prayer. Lord, we believe that you're a God who hears and answers prayer. And so we are very, very thankful, Lord, for how you've answered. And for the days ahead for Linda, Lord, as we live just one day at a time, Lord, we just trust you one day at a time. And we couldn't be in better hands than in the hands of God when we commit our lives into the hands of the shepherd. So would you hear and would you answer that prayer? And so do us all good this morning. Bless us all. And even the problems that we're having with the technology this morning, just, Lord, and, and help and encourage Gloria and Lindsay as they look after things there. And Lord, just bless them abundantly, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. I hope I never left anyone out there. I know some of the folks have had COVID and you are back again, so it's great to see you here this morning in the house of God. How are we fixed? Are we all good? Okay, well, what about if we get the kids up? Because I know the kids, you are all busting to get across the way, aren't you? We will forfeit our morning song, our morning opening hymn, to have the kids up. Come on, all the kids, come on up to the front. Come on, come on up and join us. And what are we singing? We're going to sing, God is a great big God. Esme's taking her coat off. You can keep it on, you're all right. Come on up and sing, come on. Come on over here, come on over this way so the camera can see you all. All the welcome superstars. And we've got a new friend here this morning. Matthew, isn't it? Isn't your name Matthew? Matthew's our new friend here this morning. We'll give him a big clap here. Yep. He's here with his parents. There we go. Come on over, boys and girls. You that are hiding over there in the wing. Come on, girls. Come on, he's over a wee bit. Come on over. Yeah, come on. Everybody wants to see. He's not hiding behind that pulpit there. It's not right. Come on. Let's go. Any more takers, boys? He's coming up. No? Do you want to go up with Abby or Philip? Why don't you take them up and stand there with them? That'll be good. Come on, there we go. Come on, there we go. There, there we go. One, one slightly. He's slightly resistant. Okay. Okay. Can we have great big God? Come on, all the adults stand together and let's sing. Come on, here we go. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hand.
might be for us that as well. <laughs> Somebody born in the field around here? <laughs> Somebody please go and close the door. Thanks, Sir Eloise. Didn't see too much of a stampede there here in the close up. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, I'm just going to give the announcements for the incoming week. Um, last week, I kind of grinded the halt because more bodies that were dropping and the more tests were positive, we just thought it was better after the morning service. Cancelling our Tuesday uh, evening service, our senior citizens, and also our prayer time. And this has been the first meeting back. So just to give everyone a little bit of space um, and to allow you all to come back here in one piece. Again, we want to encourage you, please. We've come in with our masks on. We're going to leave with our masks on. Just follow the one way out. Um, just trying to keep everyone safe and protected because this is still doing its rounds. William, it's great to see you. I've never even seen you coming in there. I know you haven't been well either. It's great to see you this morning. So um, if you can just keep that in mind, please. Just think about the folks around you, beside you. Uh, we want to just keep everybody safe, okay? Um, but we would like to open up again on Tuesday night for prayer. Um, we would love to have you here, so do you know what? We're just going to take a step of faith. I'll be here at half seven, and uh, if you want to join us, join us, and we want to just focus our thoughts, praying for people, for our church, and also for um, things that we've planned, God willing, during the course of the year. So um, we'll see you on Tuesday night at 7.30. Senior citizens, um, you are on. I can't imagine Bessie's going to be here. She'll be still taking her course. Um, but listen, do you know what? There's others here can help. You've got a leadership team to look after it. So the senior citizens will be on half 10 to 12 um, on Wednesday. And just basically, I'll leave it, tell you to organize it among yourselves. Um, there'll be a prayer time here, God willing, on Thursday morning, 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. If anybody wants to come and meet with us, you're more than welcome to do so. Also want to take advantage with no youth club uh, on Friday night coming because of the half-term break. And so we, um, I would love to meet with uh, the leaders of the church. We would need to have a meeting, a leaders meeting, uh, just to, to get ourselves organised um, right through, particularly to the summer months. So if the leadership, that's the deacons, elder, and also the ladies of the church who make up the leadership team, let's meet here on Thursday night at 7.30, okay? And uh, hopefully we'll take an hour just to organize everything and get things sorted. So that's um, this week. We're back again next Lord's Day, uh, 11.30, our morning worship service. We're hoping that we'll see a few more bodies back. Um, but, you know, it's great to see you that are here and the folks that are watching. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? Even the people that can't be here, they can watch online this morning and be blessed through our service. So how are we going, Gloria? Are we all good? Yeah, brilliant. Okay. So I wanted to I just take, I think that's all of our announcements out of the way. So just want to take a reading this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to read from verse 1. Let's just read God's word together and let's see what God wants to say to us this morning. <clears throat> Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you're still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom... You believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. 
Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than which is led, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And we'll just stop there and pray that God will bless his word to our hearts this morning. I don't know how many of you here listening to me today and the folks that are watching online are really into DIY. Any DIY experts here in the church? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> kind of, okay. I want to preach a message today, a lesson on DIY from a master craftsman. And from the verses that we have just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we really get an idea of the heartbeat and the background concerning the church to which Paul was writing. And Paul was writing to a church, and the church was made up just like people like you and me. Human beings coming together in a fellowship. Um, I would imagine that pastoring the church at Corinth would have been a real challenge, I have to say, when we read God's word. And in the opening eight verses, you really, you read the Apostle Paul's report concerning the spiritual temperature of the church at Corinth. And he, he didn't mince his words. He addresses the church as being fleshly. He addressed them as being carnal. He was saying, look, I, I couldn't come and give you solid food. I had to I had to give you the bottle. I had to keep feeding you milk because you couldn't endure solid food and you know, he addresses them being immature. He, he says, look, you're divisive. You're divisive people. You're coming in. You're causing divisions amongst yourselves. You're envious of, God forbid, anyone sitting here today and you're envious of the person across the way or in front of you or you want to cause division. Over 16 years, that's particularly one thing or we've managed to keep clear off here in this church which we're so thankful for, because it does happen in other places. And, you know, he, he was writing to this church, they're fleshly, they're carnal, they're divisive, they're immature, they haven't grown up, they haven't wised up, they're envious. And he was actually writing, and he says, look, I'm writing to a church, and you've all got your wee favorite preachers. Well, I know you've all got your favorite preachers, haven't you? But you know something? I don't know if that's... <laughs> You know, Paul's writing and he's saying, tell him, you've got your own preacher fan club here. There's people in the church and you say, well, I'm in Paul's fan club. And there's a boy called Apollos who was a great Bible teacher. Well, there was others and they were in Apollos' fan club. And so, you know, you can imagine the wee groupies and all, and all the, ah, we're, we're off Paul and we're of Apollos. And Paul just looks and goes, please, I mean, behave, wise up. I mean, where's all this coming from? In church? I mean, it's not the King's Hall or it's not the SSA Arena. You're not going to a pop concert. You're not going to a football club. This is church we're talking about. I mean, we're, we're, how does all this kind of stuff creep in? And he just looks at it and he says, this type of ridiculous behavior had really grieved Paul as he tries to educate the church, the Christians involved in all of this nonsense. And listen, we need to educate ourselves as well in this, folks, that it doesn't matter who the preacher who stands behind the pulpit is. 
as long as the Spirit of God is using that preacher to preach God's word and that God is the one who gets the glory. And you know, folks, whether I'm here or whether somebody else is here standing behind this pulpit, you know, if we're off on holiday, that doesn't mean to say, you know, when the mice is away, the cat will play. You know, we'll take a break as well. You know, we don't want to come and listen to this guy because we don't like him. Listen, folks, that's, that's something along the lines of what Paul's talking about. That's fleshly. That's carnal. If God is anointing the person to preach maybe a different face, might talk a little different or look a little different, but if they're bringing God's word, we should be receptive to listen and to hear God's word, right or wrong. Paul had this issue here. doesn't matter as long as God gets the glory. And you know something, folks? God has many workmen and women. And they may not do things, or sorry, they may do things in a more creative way than us. They may present in a unique style or they may use other methods to what we may be used to. But, but don't ever knock it. Don't ever dismiss it. Because if what they're doing is God-driven and God is using them, well, that's all that matters. You know, I've been fortunate enough to be at a number of conferences over the years. When I think of the FIEC conference that we attended and when we think of the Fellowship of Evangelical Workers that we attended over in England a couple of years ago, like, there was one particular guy I remember, and I've never seen the like of him before. Do you know what his ministry is? Balloon modeling. And he does this among kids. He goes into kids' groups and in, in, in schools and in, in, uh, parties, you know, birthday parties, and he goes in and he illustrates a gospel message through doing balloon modeling. And I looked at this and I thought, balloon modeling? I mean, I've never heard the like of it. God is using them and God is blessing them to get a message among children. Just like if I was to try and blow up a balloon, I'd be puffed out within two <laughs> seconds. But could you imagine, you know, doing that kind of, I mean, and I looked at that and I thought, you know what, God is so more creative than what we think. God has so many different ways that he can reach people's hearts. And you know what we try to, sometimes, I believe that we try to do, we try and squeeze God into a box, a box of our mentality. But God has so many ways, so many creative ways that he can reach hearts and reach people. And that's just one example that I think about. You know, God doesn't produce clones from a conveyor belt. He's far more creative than that. And so after his assessment was complete, Paul, the master craftsman, he proceeds to give the Corinthian church a much-needed lesson. On DIY. And we're going to look at it uh, during the course of our time today. In fact, if you look at verse 9 and 10, verse 9 and 10 is a basis of the message that we want to preach. Paul says to the church, For we are God's fellow workers. And then he says, You are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. J.B. Phillips, I love his translation of the New Testament. And he describes the two verses that I've just read as follows. In this work, we work with God. And that means that you are a field under God's cultivation, or if you like, a house being built to his plan. I, like a wise master builder who knows the job, by the grace God of God God has given to me, lay the foundation and someone else builds on it. I only say this, let the builder be careful how he builds. And I would say that that's fairly good advice, isn't it? I don't know much about DIY, but I can tell you, I think that's wise advice. Let the builder be careful how he builds. And so there's a story that I want to illustrate through this point. So if you can imagine there is a, a four-man builder and his name's Joe. And Joe has worked for his boss who owns this contract and company. He's worked for him for years 
He's a reliable worker. He's a reliable foreman. And so the boss comes to Joe and he says to Joe, Joe, listen, I'm going away for six months. I've bought a, an apartment out in the Caribbean. And do you know what? I need a bit of hate. I'm going to go off and going to leave the work to you. But here's what I want you to do, Joe. There's a house that's to be built while I'm away. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave you the budget. The budget's going to be in your hands. You get the workers. You organize. And when I come back in six months' time, I would expect the house to be built. So off the guy goes to the Caribbean, and Joe starts working. But Joe's mind starts working over time, and he thinks, do you know what? He's given me a budget. I can really work this to suit myself. So Joe then went on a course where he went to different supply companies and he negotiated and he actually started to buy lesser materials. And, you know, and he thought, well, this guy's not going to know any difference. Uh, you know, I could save a few pounds. I'll get a few invoices falsified and say at the end of it, I can make a tidy wee profit here. He's not going to be any of the wiser. I can have a few pounds in my back pocket and the house will be built. And that's what Joe did. Built it with substandard quality materials. Got the house built. It looked apart even though it was built with lesser quality materials and all stuff. And so the time came and the boss came back. The house was complete. And the boss comes all nicely suntanned. And he sees this lovely new house that's built. And he says, Joe, you've built the house. He says, there it is, boss. I've just completed it there. Hope you're happy with it. Lovely, lovely. Do you know what? Here's the keys, Joe, to your new house. <laughs> and Joe Nathaniel takes a heart attack. <laughs> Little did he know that this house was for him. And if he had have known the house was for him, here's the point, would he have built it with lesser materials? Trying to keep a little bit back for himself? No, he wouldn't have done. And you know something? That's the moral of the story here. If Joe had have known the house... He, wouldn't have built, he would have built it with the best. He would have, no shortcuts would have been taken at all. And that's why the writer says, J.B. Phillips says, let the builder be careful how he builds is the resounding message. Because in these verses, firstly, Paul uses an agricultural image which describes the church. In verse 9, he said, you're God's field. And the task of the church, folks, is to sow the seed of God's word. It doesn't do so by itself. He uses workers like you and me to sow that seed. And if we can't physically go out and sow the seed, then what we can do is we can sow faithful prayers. That's what we can do. And after we sow the seed, we cultivate the soil by watering it and constantly just working at it. You that have a garden that plants flowers and listen, you know what we're talking about. Is there a bit of work involved in it to get it to where you want it to be? But when it comes to a farmer out in the field, you know, sowing the seed, watering it, cultivate it, he's done all that he could. And then he sits back and he waits for a harvest. And you know, it's the same in church life, folks. You know, as we sow the seed and we're thinking about mission, you know, wouldn't it be great to see a harvest here again in this community, a harvest of souls being swept into the kingdom of God? And that's what we need to be praying for. And so Paul says to those that were causing division in verses 6 and verse 7, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God who gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but it's God who gives the increase. And folks, today, we need to be taking God more serious and taking ourselves less serious. Then he said to them in verse 9, not only you're God's field, but you're God's building. And you know, folks, we're the church. We are the church. The church belongs to God. You know, when people talk about coming into a building, you know, the building, the four walls, is not the church. It's the people who come in and make up the church. That's who the church are. When we talk about going to church this morning, yeah, physically we're walking in the building, but the building isn't the church. 
Listen, God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. God lives in people. He lives in our hearts. And it's when people come in, it's when God's people comes in and they fellowship together. That's what makes the church. The church belongs to God, folks. This church doesn't belong to me. I can tell you that now. It's been here a lot longer than when I've been here. Been here for over 130 years in this community. From 1889, this work has been here. Work doesn't belong to the pastor. The church doesn't belong to the leadership team. This all belongs to God, folks. Belongs to God. And if we're going to build the local church in the way that God wants it to be built, then we must comply to the necessary conditions. And I have four conditions or four headings that I want. You can either take a note off them, a mental note. You can write them down and you can think about them when you're having your lunch this afternoon. Okay? So here's the first one, folks. If we are to build the way God wants us to build, then the builder, number one, must follow the right plans. You have to follow the plans. And folks, God has a specific plan for the local church and for every individual Christian who makes up the body of the church. God has a plan, folks. God has a plan for all of our lives. It's no mistake, it's no accident that we're here today. God has a plan. God has a blueprint for all of our lives. But if you don't follow the plan, and if you try to take shortcuts like Joe did in the story, then you're going to be beat before you start. God has a plan. I was just thinking when I actually typed up those notes, who enjoys, let's be honest about it, who enjoys, you know, when you order something off Amazon or you're trying to buy something for your kids and this big box arrives and you start opening the box and there's instructions hanging out of it, you know, and you're looking at it, and it's, let's tell me to go from here to here. Who enjoys assembling all that kind of stuff? Because you do, David. Brilliant, because I am glad to hear it. The next time I get a box, it's coming to your door. There we go. Oh, listen, I used to hear it when Joel was younger, and something was sent, you know, and you opened up the box, and you're trying to assemble it. And you're at it for about three hours, and you've realised number one should have fought with number two, should have went number two, and then I went to number four, and then I had to take it off again and start all over. Have you ever been there? I haven't been on my own here in this. Praise God for some honesty in the church. Right, okay. Who enjoys following all those instructions and diagrams? For me, because it takes a bit of time and patience. And if you haven't got time and patience, if you haven't got blessed with patience, then you're going to struggle, right or wrong. Again, a quote that we plaque on the door, God grant us patience, but hurry up. Because we don't like to be patient, sure we don't. No, that's not the way we are. And so from the outset, the builder must take the time and have the patience to follow the right plans. I remember a businessman once saying to me, talking about his business, that you build up a business slowly but surely. And if a business is built up slowly and surely, if it's built that way, then it's not going to be knocked down too easy if it's built slowly and surely. And I've never forgotten that. And you know, folks, I know that we don't run a church or we shouldn't run a church in the way that we would run a business. But what you can do is you can adopt some business principles, even though the operation is different. Warren Wearsby, the writer, says, just to back up what I'm saying, the world depends upon promotion, prestige, the influence of money, and important people. That's the world. But the church, the church depends on prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit, humility, sacrifice, and service. The church that imitates the world may seem to succeed in time, but it will turn the ashes in eternity. The church in the book of Acts had none of the secrets of success that seem important in today's world. The church in the book of Acts, they didn't own any property. They had no influence in government. They had no treasury. Their leaders were ordinary men without special education, 
in the accepted schools. They had no attendance contests. They brought no celebrities in. And yet they turned the world upside down. That's what we're told in the book of Acts. And so for us this morning, as we look at the church, let's follow the right plans. Because God has a plan for the church. And God has a plan for you and me. Secondly, we must also build with the right foundations. Anybody that's involved in building, you know that, don't you? The foundations have to be right. And verse 11 says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than which is led, which is Jesus Christ. Do you know, folks, that the foundation is the most important part of the building? I'll never forget the time we got this place renovated back in 2007. And I remember that first year coming in, wondering why there was always a fusty smell in here. Fusty smell, a damp kind of a smell in the church. And it wasn't until we started to get the refurbs done here and the, fella lift, the builder lifted the carpet and realized that the floor underneath was rotten. The wood was, it was a wooden floor and it was rotten. In fact, there used to be a little organ over here in the corner. And he says, I don't know why that, that organ hasn't just fell through and collapsed. He says, look, that needs to go. We need to lift the floor and we need to concrete it. And that's exactly what had to happen. Didn't budget for it, didn't plan for it. In fact, it added a lot more money on to what we, um, you know, what we needed to do to get the place refurbed. But nobody would have known. How would you have known you have a carpet down? How would you have known that that was rotten underneath? Some builders may have had an idea of the smell, dampness, but there was a rotten floor underneath that had to go. And folks, the foundation is the most important part of the building. It determines the size, the strength, the shape of the structure. And if the foundation isn't right, the chances are that the building will collapse. I wouldn't imagine it would ever be passed by a proper building inspector. And the Apostle Paul, he had spent a year and a half previously laying the foundation of the gospel in Corinth. He made sure that a good foundation was in place. A foundation that would last. And the thing is, folks, and I'm saying this this morning, if a ministry is not founded on Christ, I am glad that I've been involved in a ministry that has stood for over 130 years that has been founded on Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of the gospel. And you know, that is a foundation that will last. If a ministry is not founded on Christ and the gospel, it won't last it doesn't matter how glamorous it might be. It doesn't matter how high techy it might be in these days or how much money is being sunk into it. It will eventually collapse if it's not built on Jesus Christ. David Jeremiah comments, The first reason that churches fail is because they violate their commitment to Jesus Christ as their foundation. Churches must be built upon Christ. Then a community of believers can glorify him through social justice, outreach, or service. To establish a church on any other foundation, even one comprised of seemingly virtuous causes, it will just not succeed. So we need to make sure, folks, not only are we building with the right plan, but we also need to make sure as a church that our foundation, a good foundation, is in place. Thirdly, as we think about this DIY master builder, we learn that the builder must use the right materials. The story that I illustrated about Joe was that he took shortcuts. He used substandard materials. <clears throat> and this is referring to the building of our own spiritual life. Folks, we must build on Christ. But some use good materials, while others use poor materials. And in fact, if you have a look at verses 12 to verse 15, Paul says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, pr precious stones, and then he uses wood, hay, and straw. Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. 
If anyone's work which he's built on endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, you that have been coming on a Tuesday night to the Teaching Tuesdays, one of the messages that we preached about was the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And we have been preaching how that after the rapture of the church, the church is raptured and they're with the Lord. During that seven year period, there is a Bema seat judgment. And this Bema seat judgment is, <coughs> is, a, is a time, it's a reference to where we will stand before the judge. That's what these verses here is referring to. Verses 12 to 15. A reference to the day that we will stand before the judge at the Bema seat where rewards for service will be handed out to every believer. And it will be a day of revelation because all will be revealed. It will also be a day of reckoning and a day of recognition and reward. Folks, on that day, trust me because it will happen when we stand before the Lord as believers the kind of material that we have used here on earth to build our spiritual life determines the kind of reward that you're going to get. And that's very self-explanatory. Notice the first three items Paul lists. Verse 12, gold, silver, precious stones. You know, they're permanent. They, they are quality materials. Gold, silver, precious stones. Fire will never hurt those three kind of materials. And they're here to stay. In fact, the likes of gold in a fire actually purifies those items. Gold, silver, precious stones, they are permanent. They are worth something. They are quality. But the last three items, wood, hay, straw, straw, we would class them as perishable goods. You know, we can pick them up anywhere, couldn't we? You'll find a bit of wood lying about a bit of street. You know, if you live close to a farm, you can pick up some straw. You know, hay, wood, hay, straw. They are perishable. Easily found, easily burned in a fire. Cheap quantity materials. Christian today, and I asked myself the question, what kind of materials are we using? What kind of materials are we building our lives with? Are we using them with quality goods or cheap quantity? Are we building with the permanent quality of God's word or with the perishable quantity of man's wisdom? And if you build with the right materials, you will produce quality and you'll receive the recognition and the rewards from our Lord. He said in verse 14, Paul wrote, If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. That's good news, isn't it? Isn't it? But the other side of the coin is if we build with cheap materials, then there's real danger. So let's build with the proper materials. Again, we just want to quote Warren Wearsby. And this is what he says. You know, we may look highly successful to men, but the day will declare it. On that day, some ministries could even go up and smoke. <laughs> Folks, why settle for second best? Use the right materials to build with. It's not a salvation issue. It's not service that saves. It's grace that saves. But both the rewarded believer and the believer who suffers loss, yes, they're both saved. Works can never earn salvation. Let me point that out. You can't work your way to heaven. It's not about doing, it's about depending. We don't get saved by how much service we give out. We are saved by God's grace. But as we are saved, we will want to serve. And I'm saying to you today, be faithful in service and earn the right to give God even greater glory in your life. Faithful. You know, as we're faithful to him, and then we can lay the rewards that we receive at his feet. I want you to think about that. And it's nearly 25 past 12, and I'm going to close. So, you know, we're building with using the right plans, using the right materials, foundation. But here's the last one. We need to build with the right motives. Our motives need to be right. 
And the motive should always be that God gets the glory. That's the motive. Why we're here today. You know, that God gets the glory in everything that we do. You know, when I, when I look at this ministry here, I thank God that over the years we have seen a develop in ministry. When I look down in the church and see the folks that are here and the kids that are here, we see the online ministry that's constantly growing. It's lovely to hear good comments. It's lovely to be encouraged. All of those things are so important. The various ministries. I would never have imagined that we would have a youth ministry of over 160 kids. Back then when we first began, you know, it was the furthest thought. You would never have imagined it. You know, when we think of the senior citizens' ministries and all of the things that happen here, our kids reach. Goodness, I remember coming here on a Sunday morning and I had a four or five-year-old sitting around her feet and he was the only child that was here. Isn't it great to look down and see the kids, even though they're smaller in number this morning, how God has blessed this work over the years. And you know, that should encourage you. You that have been even here longer than I've been here, you know and you see how God has blessed and, and developed this ministry. But you know something, folks? Everything that we do here is that God gets the glory. Our motives need to be right because God checks the motives of our hearts. But sadly, the Corinthian church that Paul was writing to, they were glorying in men. They were glorying in men. They were thinking, ah, Paul, you're a better preacher than Apollos. See, when Apollos is on, some of us are going to stay at home. See, when Paul's on, we'll all be out. And this division was caused. And Paul looked and said, this is, this is nonsense. This is carnal. Glory in men. Why do you glory in men? Never set a man on a pedestal, folks. Never have anyone on a pedestal. I'll tell you why. Because the best of men are only men at best. Honestly. And I'm going to say this again, and I've said this so often, again for the benefit of the folks that are watching online. I look at myself, folks, as a beggar giving other beggars a piece of bread this morning. That's all we are today. Sinners saved by God's grace who are being kept by God's power. And you know something? We just need to keep looking to him every day and trusting him every day. That's who we are today. And so our motives need to be right. No point in glorying in man. Paul says you're carnal. Anyone that glories in man, anyone who sets somebody up on a high pedestal, watch them fall. Honestly. And the person who's the hero one day could be the zero hero the following day. Right or wrong? Wrong motives produces wrong results. Personal pride, personal gain, selfish ambitions, all produce the wrong results. You know something, folks? A man's gift makes room for him. Not a man's face makes room for him. Oh, we've got the right person here. Push this person in. He's my mate. You know, we'll push him. No, no, no. In God's eyes, it's a man's gift, not a man's face that makes room. Carnal and fleshly churches, they don't impress the Lord at all. But you know what? See, when you and I build with no other motive than to please the Lord, then the job will be complete and his reward will be at the end of it. So folks, today, how are we building? There's the question, how are we building? Following the right plans? Using the right foundations? Using the right materials? Are we building with the right motives? This is indeed a really good lesson on DIY from a master craftsman. And I pray it will encourage your heart as we leave today. Let's just pray. And so I'm just speaking to the believer, first of all, here today. How are we build them? How are we build them today? Our own spiritual lives. In reflection to what God's word has spoken to our hearts today. How are we build them? I'm speaking to somebody even here this morning 
you're not a Christian. You haven't as yet put your faith and trust in the Lord. Maybe you've listened on and thought, well, you know, Paul's talking to a church. Well, I'm not really, I'm not a part of the church. Well, do you know what? God would love you to be a part of the church. Love to see you take that step and put your faith and trust in him and be a part of a local church somewhere. If not here, then somewhere else. God would love you to be a part of it. If you haven't as yet put your faith and trust, you can call on the name of the Lord. And every head is bowed and every eye is closed. And where you're sitting right now, if God is speaking into your heart today, I would encourage you to take that step. Put your faith in Him. Put your trust in Him. Or if you're a backslider, someone that once walked with the Lord, but you've drifted for whatever reason, you know, you know the way home. And the Father's arms are stretched out, waiting just to accept you the way you are. If you're willing to come home. We just threw that out today. And if you need to come and speak to us after the service, we'll be more than happy to take the time just to pray with you, to help you whatever way we can. Heavenly Father, as we would just still our hearts before you today. Lord, I thank you for the local church. I thank you for this body of believers who make up your witness in this corner of your field that has been here for over 130 years. Thank you for the work that has went on here over these years, the witness that has went forth from this place. And I just pray, Lord, as we are a part of it right now, that you'll help us to, to follow the right plans. Help us, Lord, to build with the right materials. Help us to lay that good foundation, to keep laying that foundation, building on Christ and doing it with the right motives. God, let our hearts be right this morning. And we pray and we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, we're going to stand. Are we all right for closing song, closing hymn? Um, can we go back to praise my soul, the King of Heaven? Thanks, Gloria. That was our opening hymn. Let's stand together and sing it. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. Let's give him praise this morning. Then we'll all leave. We'll go out and out through the center. Okay?
Tuesday night, it'll be great to see us just as we pray together and pray for the work of God here in this part of the field. Let me just pronounce a blessing just as we leave. Lord, we just thank you for every head that is bowed again. Thank you for everyone that has taken the time to listen in. Pray, Lord, that we have received something from your word and that you've spoken into our hearts from your word. Lord, take us now to your homes, respected homes, and in peace and safety until we would meet again. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen.